stand with me this morning and turn to uh, turn to page. Let's sing together to God be the glory. Let the earth hear his voice, praise. 
Welcome to Fulton this morning. We are so glad you are with us. Um, let me give you a couple of announcements, and then we will uh, have our offering. And uh, before we have offering, I want to give you a couple of prayer requests uh, that I wanted us to, to remember this morning. Um, first of all, let me give you some announcements. Uh, 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 I'll get my mind, my thoughts will start flowing here in just a second. Uh, there is a new mowing list, gentlemen, out there on the table uh, it is that time of year again, so if you could help out with mowing the churchyard, uh, we would appreciate that. So there's a new list out on the table. Also, uh, Women Active for Christ uh, will be meeting Tuesday, April the 4th at 6.30. Uh, Ms. Jean McDonald is hosting and invites all the ladies to attend. Uh, also, uh, uh, next Sunday night, a week from tonight, uh, we'll be having our WAC pre-Easter service and we will um, be praying for some missionaries we will be taking up a special offering for missions with that and then following the service we will have a meal together uh, so please keep that in mind also uh, Easter egg hunt will be next or excuse me not next but Saturday April the 15th at 10 o'clock and in conjunction with that we've been trying to get uh, candy for our Easter egg hunt and so our deadline for that will be next Sunday night so if you could bring your candy by next Sunday night, again, it's that individualized candy that will fit in the Easter eggs. We would greatly appreciate that. Uh, also, we are just two weeks away from Easter, which is hard to believe, uh, but, we, but our Easter services uh, on um, uh, Sunday, April the 16th, regular Sunday school, church, and then that evening will be our communion and feet washing, and so we hope that you will make plans to be a part of that very special day as we celebrate uh, our Lord's death but also his resurrection. And then also right around the corner will be our spring picnic which is Saturday April the 23rd. Sunday April 23rd it'll be that afternoon so please uh, mark your calendars for that. All right we'll have our ushers uh, if they would go ahead and be coming forward we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings and I want to give you a couple of prayer requests uh, 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 Pastor uh, Brother Steve Nichols, uh, who is a, uh, in our association, his wife, Miss Cheryl, passed away this morning uh, about 4.55, and uh, she had battled for a lot, long time, and uh, the Lord took her home this morning. And, uh, but also, I want us to pray for uh, Miss Faye uh, Wallace. She is in the hospital. Uh, they, her blood pressure keeps dropping, uh, bottoming out really low. And, uh, and so I wanted us to remember Miss Faye this morning, if you would. All right, so let's pray. Father, our hearts are heavy today. Lord, as I think about Brother Nichols and the loss of his wife, Lord, how we pray and ask that you would just minister to him and his family, how you would comfort them. We thank you for hope. We thank you for the hope of resurrection. We thank you the promise that, uh, that our loved ones who are with you, that we will be rejoined with them. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your word that gives us those promises. Uh, Father, we pray for Miss Faye today. Lord, that you would, uh, would you just invade her room this morning? Would your presence be ever so felt? Not only in her life, but Lord, with all that are there. We pray, Lord, that you would touch her body. We lift her up to you, Lord. We know that you can truly do all things. And so, Lord, we lift her up and pray that you would touch that blood pressure. And, Lord, it be your will that you would, uh, that we would see a tremendous turnaround. Lord, we just give her over into your care. We thank you for her love for you. Touch her body, Lord, we pray. And, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, Lord, to gather together. 
to sing praise to you, to honor you. And Lord, I pray that we just lift our hearts to you today. Minister, we pray. Thank you for this offering. We pray your blessings in Christ's name. Amen. sing together I am resolved.
Children's Church can be dismissed this morning. We are uh, working our way through the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And if you have your Bibles, you can be turning with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. April 12th, 1861 to May 9th, 1865, July the 28th, 1914 to November the 11th, 1918, September the 1st, 1939 to September the 2nd, 1945. Now if you're a history person, you probably recognize what those dates are. Those are the dates of the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. In the book, The Lessons of History, the, the authors write, War is one of the constants of history and has not diminished with civilization and democracy. In the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 268 have seen no war. And that doesn't include the unrecorded history that we don't have, which more than likely had just as much as recorded does. We come to the seventh beatitude this morning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, where Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The importance of this beatitude, I think, is, is kind of summed up in a statement I came across, and it says this. This divine pronouncement, understood, taken to heart, and applied by the Holy Spirit, can not only bring inner peace and troubled hearts, or to our troubled hearts, but also make us instruments of peace, peacemakers. So this morning I want us to look at three things about this idea of being a peacemaker. The first thing is just the peacemaker. What is a peacemaker, what it is not and what it is. We've been doing this for absolutely every beatitude we've been looking at. What, what, it is, what is not saying versus what it is saying. So let's look at what the peacemaker is not. Again, I want uh, one other quote I had because it just it sums it up so well. Uh, he said, a peacemaker is not, as commonly supposed, the kind of person who is easygoing and laissez-faire who does not care what anyone else does as long as it does not directly affect him. Neither is the peacemaker always tolerant. You do your thing and I'll do mine. Nor is the peacemaker an appeaser, the kind who wants peace at any price. Appeasement does not make for peace. A peace so a peacemaker is not someone who doesn't care. A peacemaker is not someone who's always tolerant. And someone is not always an appeaser. So then what is a peacemaker? Because listen, our culture would say that's what a peacemaker is. You're tolerant, you appease everyone, you make everybody happy. So then what in the world is Jesus talking about when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Well, let's look at the word peace for just a moment. The word peace comes from the Hebrew word, as we probably many of us may have heard, that comes from the Hebrew word shalom. Actually, I tell people every so often, I'll shake their hands, and I'll be like, well, shalom. And, and, they're, and they, you kind of get an interesting look. So, uh, but shalom, the idea has the, has the idea of wholeness and overall 
well-being. It, is, it always means everything which makes for the person's highest good. William Barclay tells us that they do not mean that they wish for the others only the absence of evil things. So it's not just taking away evil things from someone when you say shalom, but it's that they wish for them the presence of all good things. So in the Bible, the peace means not only freedom from all trouble, it means enjoyment of all good. So it's not so when you say shalom to someone, you're saying, listen, not, not only does does uh, do I not want you to have to go through evil or face evil and have evil, but I want you to experience all the good that God has for us. So let's look at some the peacemakers, the characteristics and the actions of a peacemaker. A peacemaker, first of all, is truthful. The peacemaker is truthful. Uh, if there is a problem, the peacemaker will admit it that there's a problem. Because listen, you, you can't, again, this idea of appeasing or, or so what we sometimes do is we just pretend it's not there. And if we pretend it's not there, then there'll be peace, right? That's kind of how we think about it. Ezekiel, uh, and, and not just Ezekiel, this is just one of many, many examples we could look at. But Ezekiel, uh, we see that Ezekiel uh, was a peacemaker, uh, but again, it's not how, we, how culture would teach being a peacemaker. He said in Ezekiel 13, verses 10 and 11, he said, Precisely because they have misled my people, saying peace when there is no peace, and because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash, say to those who smear it with whitewash that it shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain, and you, O great hailstones, will fall, and a stormy wind breaks. So what is happening is the Lord told Ezekiel to call out all the false prophets of that day. When you look at Ezekiel 13 overall, it's calling out all these false teachers and these false prophets that were in the land. And so they, what these false prophets were saying, they, they were saying that the Lord had spoken when the Lord had not spoken. They were prophesying things when the Lord had never given them a prophecy to prophesy about. And they were saying peace when there was no peace. And so the Lord tells Ezekiel, you call them out. Be truthful. Because the reality is to be truthful, there is times you have to call things out for what they are. Now, the example, I want us to, to see this example here because what was happening is, is, is these people were saying that there's this peace and these, these false prophets were saying, oh, everything is good and there's peace in the land and there's peace within ourselves. And, and the reality was there wasn't peace. They were giving them a false peace. And, and the, the example we see here in these two verses that I mentioned, and you can read on into the chapter about this, but the example in these two verses is that there was uh, like the idea of, of a wall. And this wall is about to fall, and these false prophets come along, and they just they put a little plaster in, a, in just one little spot, and they're going to say, well, everything's great now. We, we kind of patched, the, the whole, we patched this little crack here when the whole wall is about to fall. And they think because they put a little bitty patch that that's going to solve the problem. And God tells Ezekiel, you let them know the whole wall is going to fall. And his judgment's going to come when you look at Ezekiel 13. And God was going to judge these false prophets. And when the wall fell, they were going to be taken out. Now I've said it before and I'm going to say it again here. The world needs Christians to be willing to tell people the truth about their condition to God so that they can repent and trust Christ as Savior and Lord so that they can experience true peace that only comes through by God through Jesus Christ. The peacemaker is truthful. 
The peacemaker isn't just so, well, you can believe in some kind of God. You can go to the religious buffet and you can gather up on your plate whatever. You can pull a little from here and you can pull a little from there and, and you can, and whatever, if it, if it fits you and it feels right and it makes you feel better about yourself. If you want to pull those things together and create this little facade of, of spiritual belief that you want to, then you'll be okay. Whereas the truth is, that we're sinners, that we sin in front of a holy God, to a holy God, and that, that our sin separates us from that holy God, and the only way we get back in right relationship with that one true living God is it by gathering the stuff from the religious buffet, but by repentance and trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on a cross and rose from the dead three days later. That's truth. And it is that truth that gives someone true peace. Not some facade, not some fake peace. And I'll just throw in here that we also need some preachers throughout our land who's willing to stand up and preach the whole counsel of God. And the reality is we need some people who's willing to call out false teachers and false prophets and call them exactly what they are. The peacemaker stands for truth. The peacemaker also takes risks. One writer put it this way, anytime we attempt to bring peace personally or societally, we necessarily risk misunderstanding and failure. If we, if we have been wrong, there is the pain of apologizing. On the other hand, we may have to shoulder the equally difficult pain of rebuking another. The temptation is to let things slide. It is so easy to rationalize that trying to bring true peace will, quote, only make things worse. So my question for us who name the name Jesus is, are you and I willing to take that risk for true peace? Are we willing to stand for truth and take that risk? I love how Bar Barclay said it this way. He said, the peace which the Bible calls blessed does not come from the evasion of issues, but it comes through facing them, dealing with them, and conquering them. And I tell us today that the making of peace at times, even the way of peace, is through struggle. It's through struggle. So the peacemaker stands for truth. The peacemaker takes risks. And the peacemaker is, is peaceable. Culture tells us that in order to be peaceable, then one must never confront. One must never tell someone that they're wrong. That's just like a cuss word now. We can use the elf word all day long. But Lord forbid we tell somebody they're wrong. Right? I mean, is it just me? So, so we, can't, we, we can't tell someone they're wrong. We never confront someone, especially if they feel that it's right. Culture says, listen, culture tells us this. False peace at any price. Not peace at any price. False peace at any price. We just, we got to have our safe spaces, right? We can't handle someone telling us that what you're thinking is bad thinking. That what you're trying to tell us is good is really evil. That what you're trying to justify is really what's called a sin. We just can't do that in our culture. Because we want a false peace at any price. Now, I do want us to know that we as believers, we do pursue peace. We want to be peaceable people. We aren't to live lives of turmoil all the time. However, we must always stand for truth.
Now, in the church, we strive for peace. Right? We want peace. In a world of chaos and turmoil and all that's going on, boy, there needs to be a place where you can come and there's peace. And the church is it. So how do we keep peace? Well, I think there's, I I just want to hit on something this morning. And that is what we call secondary issues. Secondary issues should never break the unity of peace in the church. Ephesians 4, 3, Paul says, Eager to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there are some essentials we need to be willing to die for, right? Who God is, who Jesus is, who the Spirit is, what the doctrine of the church is, what salvation is, that He was virgin born, that He lived a perfect life, that He died a vicarious death for us on the cross, that He physically rose from the dead. Those things we go to the grave for. Right? That scripture is inspired, it is inerrant, it is infallible, it is God's word to us. We don't, we we, we die on that mountain for that. But there are secondary things. There are things that's not essential, like those things I've just mentioned. That the reality is over the years, secondary things has completely ripped the church apart. And I'm here to encourage us and to challenge us and to remind us that secondary things should never tear us apart. Paint colors should never tear us apart. Carpet should never tear us apart. Right? Right? Silly things should never tear us apart. Apart. We're two weeks away from Easter. And for us, for Easter, we are going to celebrate the Lord's uh, uh, Supper or snack, however you want to define it. Uh, uh, since you get such a small piece of cracker, you know what I mean. So, so the Lord's Supper, but also uh, would, would we, Free Will Baptists, do feet washing. Can I just be honest? Though, we, we, it, though it's an ordinance that we hold to, it's a secondary thing. It's not essential to salvation. You can get saved, love Jesus, know Jesus, serve Jesus your entire life, never do it. And you're still right with God. Now, do we, we hold that it is a special thing, it is a, it's a... It's a, hum, it's a humility thing. It is a thing of just humbling before your brother or sister in Christ. Guys do guys and girls, uh, wash feet of girls. But it's a matter of humbling yourselves before your brother or sister in Christ and before your Lord and just saying, I am your servant. I am your brother or sister in Christ. I'm here to serve you, love you, care for you, be here for you. But my point is we should never let that something like that interfere with fellowship amongst us. Should never cause issues. Should never cause strife. Should never cause someone to feel bad if they don't do it. Or we look down on someone because they don't do it. Because the reality is it's a secondary thing. Do we want everyone to do it? Sure we do. But it should never cause strife. And unless those things are essential to who God is, who the scriptures teach about who God is, about salvation, about all those central things that we hold to so dearly, may it never tear us apart. Because the peacemaker is peaceable. A second thing I want us to see is the ultimate peacemaker. Jesus Christ is the ultimate peacemaker. Peacemaker. He is the Prince of Peace. So how did Christ make peace? He made it for mankind. Colossians 1, 19 and 20 says this. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on the earth or in heaven, making peace, now catch it, making peace by His blood. 
He didn't look the other way, right, in dealing with this whole sin issue. He didn't say, well, let's just ignore that because I'm a God of love. We'll just overlook that, right? He didn't do that. It says he made peace by his blood. which means blood had to be spilled in order to make that peace. That means crucifixion had to take place because it was upon the cross that he paid for our sins and his blood was spilled. Ephesians 2 13 through 17. So he made peace by his blood. Now listen to Ephesians. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in, to, in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. So by his blood he made peace, and by becoming our peace, did you catch it? Early on in those verses it says, he became our peace. So because he became our peace, he can then give us peace. It's like we've said over and over and over again. There's only one person who's ever walked this planet who died for you to remove your sin. No other religious figure has ever done it. There was only one, and it was God the Son Jesus Christ who died for you, who died for me and he shed his blood so that he could give us his peace. That's why you find you don't get peace anywhere else. That's why everybody else that's religiously speaking and they even have any kind of concept of heaven, they just use the word, well, I kind of hope, like I wish, I hope I get there. I hope my good outweighs the bad. I'm a pretty good person, so I'm, I'm hoping I get there. Well, the reality is it doesn't get you there. Because it was only one who shed his blood to give us peace. And it's Jesus. He's it. So Christ, not only is he shows us, is he the ultimate peacemaker, he shows us how to be peacemakers. Now catch this, Christ was truthful. Christ took risks. Christ was peaceable. So how can we be peacemakers? Well, we be, we, we be, we need to be like Jesus. We be like Jesus. I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. I'm hip. So if we're going to be peacemakers, one, we have to be forgiven. We have to have His peace. We have to have experienced His peace so that we can in turn be peacemakers. So we have to know the peace of God that comes through Jesus. We have to humble ourselves like Christ did in Ephesians chapter 2, 3 through 8. I encourage you to go read that. But in those verses, we see that, 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 that he humbled himself. And we have to rely on the Holy Spirit who dwells within believers to help us, encourage us, strengthen us, push us forward to be peacemakers. So what's the reward? Well, the reward is in the second half of the verse, isn't it? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Sons of is a typical Hebrew expression. Uh, it, 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 for example, uh, a man may be called a son of peace instead of a peaceful man. 
right? It's just a way they express it. Barnabas in the New Testament. Barnabas is called the son of encouragement rather than being called something like, I called him Barnabas the encourager, right? It's just he's the son of of it, it describes so the peacemaker shall be called sons of God because they're doing God like work they are doing the same work that the God of peace is doing we're doing what Jesus did and does in the world now please understand that 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 uh, if we do this, if we, we strive to be these peaceable people, that, that being that peaceable person, uh, uh, that's not making us right with God. I don't want us to walk away thinking that it's because, well, I'm doing this peaceable thing. I'm trying to live a peaceable life. I'm trying to live this good, peaceable life, and that makes me right with God. That doesn't make you right with God. It wouldn't make me right with God. Again, it's being right with God is through a relationship through Jesus Christ. But because we have that relationship with Jesus Christ and He's given us that peace, He then en enables us to be peaceable people. So are you a peacemaker? Am I a peacemaker? Peacemaker, remember, peacemaker is not an appeaser. We, we, we have got to get rid of the worldly way of describing being a peacemaker. That we avoid everything, we don't talk about anything, we, we just sweep that under the rug, we just kind of let that go, because we want peace. Now, is there a right time for it and a wrong time for things? Absolutely there is. That's why you rely on the Holy Spirit. Because if we did it all in our flesh, we would blow it every time. We must first know Christ and His peace, which comes through salvation. And then second, we have to humble ourselves and rely on the Spirit who lives within us to be the peacemaker that God wants us to be. Now think about this. But if we, if, if we through the, the strength of the Spirit, uh, 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 do this thing called being a peacemaker, we're doing God's work. So if you wonder, well, what does the Lord want me to do? Be a peacemaker. Stand for truth. Love people. Don't be an appeaser. There's no such thing as a safe space. There's just not. We can try to create a so-called safe space, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Because if I tell you something and you just don't like what you hear, it's not going to kill you. I'll save some of that for tonight as we look at Daniel 3. But are you a peacemaker? Are you a peacemaker? That also tells us what? In closing, we're not troublemakers. Well, you say, well, how can you, how can you, well, if you're going to confront people and you call things for what they are, isn't that being a troublemaker? No, that's just being truthful. And the reality is sometimes truth hurts, doesn't it? For all of us as sinners, before we came to Christ, when we got confronted with our sin, did we really like it? You know? Did we really look at that and go, wow, I really am a horrible human being. Thank you so much, Holy Spirit. Right? The reality is sometimes truth hurts. But also if we're willing to listen to the truth, and obey the truth, it's through that truth that you find peace. Peace like you've never had before. Peace that you'll never find anywhere else. Let me get you to stand.
every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. See, the, the starting point is, do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with God? Not because you're a good, quote-unquote, good person. Not because you try to do good things. Not because you try to help people out. Not because you try to live a peaceable life. But do you have peace with God because you've repented of sin and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have peace with God? If you're here this morning and you say, Michael, I don't have that peace. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I've, I've, I've kind of heard who Jesus is, kind of heard some things, but I, I've, not, I've not repented of my sin. I've not turned from my sin. I've entrusted in Jesus like that. I, I don't have peace with God. I would love to pray for you. Not that my prayer is going to save you. Only repentance and faith in Jesus saves you. But I would love to pray for you that you would indeed surrender your life to Him. If you're here this morning and you say, I need that relationship with Christ, would you please pray for me? Just slip your hand up and put it right back down. No one's looking around. No one's going to think anything of you because they're not looking around. So if you're here this morning and you say, I need that relationship with Jesus. Christian, are we living life as peacemakers? Being all that a peacemaker is, not through our own strength and flesh, but through the Spirit who lives in us. If maybe the Lord's touched your life, touched your heart about that particular thing this morning, I'd like to pray for you. Can I get you to slip your hand up and put it right back down very quickly? Very quickly. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Father, we thank you for a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for saving us. Lord, we just give you thanks and praise today. We, we honor you today. We love you today. We, we, we just want to praise you for the good God that you are today. Lord, as we get ready to leave this place, I pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us this evening. And Lord, I pray that you have been glorified through all that's been said and done this day. And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Before we go, just one quick announcement. Uh, deacons and wives for the bill, Miss Hope, if, we, if Holly and I could meet with you, nothing wrong, bad.